Um, today, um, the person who's uh, presenting, the fellow who's presenting um, is Dr. Annie Haji from Harbor UCLA. Um, she's one of my outstanding fellows. Um, and she's going to be speaking about um, an article that came out in Jason. It's actually so hot off the presses. Actually, it's not even off the press yet. And so, um, Dr. Haji, the you'll see from the PDF that we sent around, it's still um, in the accepted version, not even the typeset version. We're super lucky. Um, uh, Dr. Elaine Koo from UCSF, she was the first author um, and the corresponding author. She's going to be available for the first half hour. Um, and there's also going to be a couple other um Oh, yeah, Dr. Karen Wong, who is also another author on the paper, and she is actually um, a vascular surgeon, so I think it'll be great to get a surgeon's point of view. Um, Rob Quinn, um, he is the current ISPD president. Um, he is also one of the PIs of the um, North American um, catheter registry that we talked about of uh, the results from last time, so he knows a lot about catheters. Um, Arsh Jain, who is a um, nephrologist, great at PD, but he's also put in um, hundreds, if not thousands of PD catheters, I believe. Um, and so we've got a lot of great discussions here. Um, and Dr. Haji, I'll, I'll go ahead and hand it off to you now. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Haji, um, and this is the West Coast ISPD Journal Club. So let's get started. Okay, so the article that we are discussing today is the peritoneal dialysis catheter complications after insertion by surgeons, radiologists, or nephrologists. So this article um, came out last month. So the question that we are answering today is uh, the probability of needing a follow-up procedure within 90 days of placement of a PD catheter that may vary by the type of operators that are inserting the catheter. So you have multiple operators. You have the general surgeon, you have your vascular surgeon, you have your interventional radiologist, and you have your interventional nephrologist. So basically the question is from these four operators, what is the probability of a follow-up procedure within that 90 days? So just a little introduction um, from the article itself. So the in United States, um, the use of home dialysis is low. However, there is a high interest from patients. Now, the benefit of doing dialysis at home is first off, it's at home. You know, it's flexibility. It's um, shorter intradialytic gaps. You have better volume control you have better um, preservations of the renal uh, function. And it's the survival um, from the studies is it's very similar to the in sector survival. So basically the goal of the Advancing American Kidney Health uh, Initiative is basically to increase the use of home dialysis. So as far as the method, the study population, the source that was gathered, that was used was the US renal data system. The inclusion criteria was um, patients age 18 or greater at the time of the initial PD catheter placement. Um, traditional Medicare insurance was used. Patient was never treated with PD in the past. The procedures were performed between January 1st, 2010 to June 30th, 2019. And as far as when it comes to billing or how it was identified for the PD catheter, they use the codes as um, listed here, and they stand for laparoscopic, percutaneous, and open insertion of the PD catheters respectively. So as far as, as we continue, there are some exclusion criteria as well. So if you look at this algorithm here, you, you start off with um, your N number as 68,909. So from that, there was a lot of exclusion. So we'll just kind of go down um, this algorithm. So unknown physician specialty or identifier, there are about 6,841. So that was omitted. Um, PD that was placed during inpatient, that was omitted. Urgent PD use, in other words, PD, you know, um, ended up being used less than seven days from the creation, 
that was excluded. Buried PD catheter, that was excluded. Any transplant, recovery, or discontinuation within 90 days of the placement, that was excluded. And any missing information from the patient, that was excluded. So from all these um, exclusion criteria, our N is 46,973. Okay, so as far as methods, so exposure again, the operator and their specialty. So general surgery, vascular surgery, IR, and interventional nephrology. The covariates, so the demographics um, of the patient, the comorbidity of the patient, and incomes were all um, included in this study. Um, other uh, insertion factors were, was it laparoscopic, or was it percutaneous? Uh, versus open. And this was all part of the, um, from the insurance claims. It is assumed that interventionalist procedures were percutaneous. Um, and then also the number of procedures annually was based on Medicare uh, claims. All right. Now, as far as the outcome, so the primary outcome or like for the need uh, follow-up procedure within 90 days um, was because of second PD catheter placement, uh, catheter revision or catheter removal. Oh, I see a chat. What is this? Yes, CPT codes are included in the Medicare claims for billing. Yes. Okay. All right, so statistical analysis. So basically the frequency for the follow-up procedures of the different operators, they were all tallied. Um, the analysis that was used was the violin plot for each operator uh, type, which is determined uh, the distribution of the probability of each PD catheter outcome. We also um, used the mixed effects logistic regression model, which was used to examine the association between the operator and the need for the follow-up within the 90 days. So basically it accounts for the operator, the same operator doing several procedures as well as it was adjusted for the covariates of the patient. Okay, now as far as the results. So overall um, there was 5,205 operators between the general surgery, vascular, interventional radiology, and uh, interventional nephrology. The mean age of the patient was 64 years old of age. The median time for the kidney um, replacement therapy was about 11 days. So looking at this chart, so we'll kind of just go through it. So the total number is 46,973, um, and then uh, if you just look at the surgery type, the laparoscopic, um, percutaneous, open, so 79% was laparoscopic, percutaneous, 20.9% was open. As far as the ages go, um, the different ages, so 18 to 29 was 2.3%, 30 to 64 was 37%, age 65 and <clears throat> three was 60.5%. Of all that, 42% um, um, or female. As far as the race goes, 4.9% was Asian, Native American, Pacific Islander, 7.9% were Hispanic, and 19% was non-Hispanic Black. And then as far as the BMI uh, classification, about 30.5% overweight and 41.7% were obese. Those, I just kind of wanted to um, make you guys kind of look at that, the overweight and obese um, population. So the other things that really um, also that I that's highlighted in red, I kind of want to um, make stand out is if you look at interventional radiology, 63.8% uh, were age 65 and greater. Now, if you compare that to the interventional nephrology and then general surgery and vascular surgery, they have the highest percentage of patient population greater than 65. If you look at interventional nephrology, 42.4% were age 30 to 64, so a younger population. 
And then also, if you take a look, it's just interesting to see that um, then you have interventional nephrology, 17.8% were primarily Hispanic. Oh, I see chats going on in here. What's, let me, sorry, what, what's going on in the chat? Uh, yes, urgent PD start was excluded. Wondering yep. about type as the lower IQR is 19. So there are two things. Somebody was asking if mm -hmm. urgent start was excluded, then how come the median time to kidney replacement therapy between the insertion of the catheter and the mm -hmm. start of therapy was 11? Because mm -hmm. um, most of us think of urgent start as within 14 days. Mm -hmm. And as uh, Dr. Jane uh, pointed out, in this paper, they had to find urgent start as um, using the catheter within seven days. Yeah. Um, Dr. Marotra um, noted that there is um, likely a, there's definitely a typo because the median time to kidney replacement therapy was 11. The mm -hmm. interquartile range is 19 on the lower bound, 25%, and 197 on the upper bound. So 11 is not between 19 and 197. Mm -hmm. So I think it's probably um, a typo. But how are you? Right. Yeah, thank you. yeah. So I'm not sure if um one of the authors um might know the um correct uh time median time for kidney replacement therapy. And Dr. Saxena is pointing out that um urgent start would be within three to seven days, and early start would be more than seven days. Another question for initiation of KRT is like. Uh, initiation of training versus like patients starting in home. Different centers have used different definitions for that time to KRT. Um, I don't think that was specified. Yeah, it's, it's not specified in paper, but um, that's the problem in clinical practice I see and how to interpret in those from those paper. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I just wonder, we have so oh, many practicing physicians here in this group. How do they define in their center a time to KRT? KRT, um, mm -hmm. like from the day of PD training starting, where they are dwelling fluid for a few hours while they are showing to the patient, or they call it when they start at home? You no, know, it just, just is, before you answer the question, I think this saw that YL put it that the paper says interquartile range starts from minus 19. This has to mean that many people, so you cannot start PD before the catheter is placed. So KRT includes HEMA. KRT, these are people also in HEMA. Yeah, that's and so this is not starting. Um, this is Elaine. That's correct. So yes. So some PD catheters went in and patients could start hemo in the meantime and then transition to PD. That's why it's negative 19 days. Oh, so they're literally meaning KR, not just PD. Mm -hmm. Correct. It's not the medium time to PD. It's the medium time to start any kind of kidney replacement therapy. Okay. Any other comments? Oops. All right. So as far as um, the results, so median number of catheter placed per year. So interventional nephrologist placed three. So that's the median number per year. Surgeons uh, between 2.2 .2 to 2.4 median per year and interventional radiologist one catheter placed per year. That's the median number. Um, other things, so in this slide, what I kind of want to get the focus on is you have these different comorbidities. You see that um, when it comes to heart failure, so it's a pretty good amount. It's about 23% um, heart failure. Amen. Okay. <laughs> so... That's what I want to point out. Another thing that I do want to point out is if you look at the interventional nephrology, the box, so you see um, CAD, um, peripheral vascular disease, heart failure, uh, stroke, 
um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, COPD. So it's very interesting to see that um, the population, the comorbidities under the interventional nephrology. It's also very interesting that you see it's um, having heart failure, which is really good for PD anyway overall because, you know, to help with the UF. So the next thing that I also want to point out too is the year of the PD placement. So if you look at 2015 and 2019, you see that with IR as well as interventional nephrology, look at if you look at the number, 62%, 60.9%, those are much higher than the vascular surgery and general surgery. So I guess when I look at it, it's kind of what I think of is, is there a push towards more of the interventional radiology, interventional nephrology, kind of taking more over um, the PD care. Uh, let's see what's in the chat box. Oh, thanks. You're welcome. Okay. So now this slide basically, so this is a requirement for a follow-up procedure and PD function within 90 or 180 days by operator type. So follow-up, no follow-up, no removal, no procedure was 84.5%. Um, use of PD overall was 78.4% from the placement. Now, if you look again at the interventional radiology and interventional nephrology, the box in red, if you look as far as um, the follow-up, for second PD implantation, those two specialties were higher than the general surgery and vascular surgery. So interventional radiology had 6.9% of a second PD implantation. Um, it had 8.9% of PD catheter removal. And then if you look at interventional nephrology, 7.4% had needed a second PD catheter implantation, and then a 9.5% uh, removal of the PD catheter. Um, and another thing that I wanna show, kind of highlight is if you look under interventional radiology, the use of PD was 59.7%, the lowest compared to the other three specialties. And then as far as the outcome within the 180 days of the PD placement, it was very, it was similar to the 90 days. So this is the violin plot, um, which is my first time seeing it. So this basically shows um, interventional nephrology is kind of cut off um, on the side is a little bit higher as far as the follow-up procedures in the 90 days um, compared to, again, the general surgery and vascular and second being interventional radiology. Um, this slide here, so this is the uh, mixed logistic model this is basically the odds of the peritoneal dialysis catheter follow-up within 90 days and 180 days. So again, if you look at the odds ratio, the interventional nephrology is higher compared to the general surgery and vascular surgery. Again, same um, results in the 180-day um, follow-up. So sensitivity analysis, it was similar, so outcome. So only insertion of the second PD catheter or removal follow up to 180 days. Um, so it was all the same, um, which also including the urgent catheter use, including the inpatient procedure without the AKI, including the volume of procedures of operator in the model, as well as including pre-dialysis in the model. It was similar. Okay. So effect modification. So number of annual procedures per year was examined as a potential effect modifier of the relationship between the operator type and the PD catheter outcome. 
So for example, like does the association change depending on how many catheters placed per year? Yes. So every one fewer procedure a year, odds of needing a follow-up procedure. So increased for general surgeon and decreased for IR. So let's go back to the, uh, the question that we first saw. So the question was, does the probability of needing a follow-up procedure within 90 days of placement of a PD catheter vary by the type of operator inserting these catheter? So the answer is yes. So overall, the odds of needing a follow-up procedure within 90 days were highest for interventional nephrologists followed by interventional radiologists. These findings persisted even after adjustment for procedural approach and accounting for factors such as the BMI, the procedure volume, and including or excluding PD catheters that were used urgently within seven days of their initial placement or placed in the inpatient setting outside of an AKI context. So some strengths and weaknesses um, of this article. So the strength, it was the large N, which is great. Weaknesses, unfortunately, uh, was it was only for patients who were insured by Medicare. So it wasn't all insurance. Um, there was unknown cause of the follow-up or cause of the non-functioning catheter or PD removal. So we don't know why the PD was removed. We don't know why there was a follow-up. We don't know why it was non-functioning. Um, there was unknown pre-procedural complications related to the approach to the insertion of the PD catheter. And then as well as uh, selection bias from the operators. Uh, there's a chat. Let's see. Uh, close to one to every four PD catheters requires a second procedure within 90 days. I did not know it was that high. Yes, higher than in the ISPD North American catheter registry. Yeah. Uh, so discussion. So should we stop um, interventional nephrologists from doing catheters? I don't personally think we should stop. I think if anything, um, we need more training, more teaching from others. Um, and the more we train, the more we teach, we can meet that goal of doing home dialysis, which is the initiative um, of the U.S., uh, advantages of being an interventionalist. You don't need general anesthesia, which is great. Um, annual volume of placement per operator. It's low. Um, there was an Ontario study that said um, interventional nephrologists place catheters more <laughs> likely to be than radiologically or um, laparoscopically inserted catheters. So this, what I want to point out is in this study in 90 days, there was a 15.5% that needed a follow-up procedure. However, this um, chart here, uh, this actually shows, if you look um, where it says procedure, um, within three months, it's 6.7%. Oh, yeah. I so this figure, sorry, this no. figure is a figure that was pulled from the article that we um, went over last journal club which was data from the North American <clears throat> uh, ISPD, North American uh, catheter registry. Um, I don't know, Rob, if you uh, want to comment on this. Yeah, so I mean, I think it's it's interesting you show this. You know, when Matt and I looked at this in the PD catheter registry, the rate was about one in nine, one in one in, in, in yeah, 10 kind of uh, would have a procedure kind of by six months. So the rates that they saw in this analysis are actually quite quite a bit higher than we've seen so far in the in the catheter registry. Uh, granted, the sites that participate in the catheter registry are probably a little bit more motivated than the average site in in the U.S. Um, but you know, if you look at, at kind of in the best hands, regardless of the method of insertion, you would expect the event rate to be much lower. The other striking thing is the volumes. Um, you know, we have a lot of operators in the registry that have over 100 procedures a year, um, just to put things in perspective. And we're talking about, you know, median rates and, or median experience of kind of like, you know, one to two per year, which I think is is much, much lower. Um, so there, there are some really marked differences, I think, in, in the, the, the populations and the, and the operators that were sampled for these two studies. 
Thanks so much. And um, I did want to note, because I know that Dr. Ku is going to have to log off any minute now. Um, many people were commenting that it is important to know how many catheters were removed due to peritonitis um, um, and not due to um, exit site infections, because if you're removing the catheter because of an infection, it's not necessarily uh, related to the procedure of the catheter placement. It's not really necessarily an operator um, associated issue. Um, and so uh, Dr. Ku noted that the, the rate of infection was really low within the first 90 days. And that's why they did not report it, although they did look briefly at it. Um, there was another question that um, was a repeat procedure of PD catheter revision or any procedure. Um, Dr. Hussein did note that it's broken down in the uh, in the paper, and Dr. Ku um, noted that the repeat procedure is any revision as billed through claims data, but details in the specific revision uh, are not available. Okay, Dr. Haji, if you want, um, you can uh, keep going. I think we'll okay. Pause. Thank you. I was going to answer this question, but thank you, Dr. Shen, for doing that. Um, okay. And now this is a new article um, that came out, yeah, October 31st. Uh, Dr. Shen, did you want to comment on this one? Yeah, actually, if um, Dr. Zhang is actually on the call, um, CJ, do you want to um, summarize your uh, your paper? Yeah, we uh, look at... Um... Uh, retrospectively look at our surgeon versus uh, IR placement of PD catheter from 2011 to 2013. Uh, that's the time we, you know, we used to have only exclusively uh, surgeon plates PD catheter, but as our PD program expands, uh, two of our surgeon uh, IR, Todd Drayson and uh, Paul DeBro, they start to place PD catheter under uh, IR. Again, this is a, you don't need general anesthesia. So what we find is uh, one year patency rate is better with surgeon than IR. Surgeon is like 92 or 93%, IR is about 80%. Uh, that was uh, in the 10 years ago. Um, we're looking at uh, more recent data now. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Goldberg, you have your hand up. Yeah, Jenny, the, the implication that the early removal of PD catheters uh, for infection uh, has not been my experience. The early removal uh, is due to, uh, uh, more often than not, is due to omental wrapping, which can't be reconciled uh, short of removing and, and potential replacement or not at all. But I haven't seen early infection as a cause of uh, catheter loss. Uh, but I've been doing this for a long time. That I would put that low on the, on the list. Thanks. Um, first of all, Dr. Haji, thank you. That was an excellent presentation. And thank you for managing the chat at the same time as well. Um, uh, um, Dr. Goldberg, that's a great point. And actually, I thought this would be a nice time actually to transition to our operators that are um, on the call. So unfortunately, Dr. Wu, she actually came from a procedure and she actually has to go back to the OR now. Um, but I think uh, Dr. Jane is still on the call. Uh, yeah, it's a very uh, interesting uh, paper, and thanks for uh, sharing this. I did see it come up. Um, I definitely echo what Rob was saying, Dr. Quinn, with regards to operator experience. So we um, teach the PDU uh, INIR course, uh, where you know people will come and learn about insertions and then go back and do them. The ASDIN says you need about 15 or 20, I think, is the number in, in the ASDIN to be certified as being competent. In my experience teaching uh, people how to do uh, PD catheter insertions, I think the number is more like 50. Um, so I'm surprised at how low this number is, uh, like you know, one, two, or three catheters per year. I do 50-ish a year. And I'm not even the busiest uh, inserter. 
Um, so it, it seems like uh, astronomically low, uh, which I think would really, really impact outcomes. Uh, and then I, I think it also say, you know, I think it's very helpful to have this information. I'm, I'm worried about the a visual abstract, you, you know, where it's, you know, people will just go to that bottom line and, and look at it and say, oh, okay, well, you know, interventional nephrologists shouldn't be putting in catheters because I'm not sure that's really what even the discussion of the paper is kind of alluding to. Yeah, Dr. Ku, um, before she had to log off, she kind of made a point that she was hoping that in the discussion it came through that the goal isn't to discourage people from using interventional nephrologists. Actually, so Arsh, how many have you put in? I've probably done about like seven or eight hundred. Wow. <laughs> um, so I think she's saying the goal isn't to discourage anyone from placing them, just to kind of start thinking about where we can improve. And I guess something that I want to talk to everybody about is, um, you know, there are some people who said, well, should we have like centers of excellence where you have like one person in the area who's very well trained, be it a surgeon, IR, interventional nephrologist, and just refer everybody there. Um, but I feel like I don't see that happening very well in the area where we practice. Uh, I, I don't know, but I might, I just might have a my own point of view. I, I don't see what everybody else felt. I can jump in. Sorry, uh, Jenny. Um, uh, so in Ontario, we do have that model of centers of excellence. So we get referrals from you know, quite a distance uh, away. Uh, and, so, and at my center, I have both a surgeon and, and uh, you know interventional uh, nephrologist. So you know, we, we kind of have a, a full package in what we can deliver. It's, it's such a great model. It needs to be incentivized and you know have to have a lot of buy-in from, from people. But it really has worked. So we took a program that had a, a PD rate of about 11% and they're up to 21% or 22% now because um, of reliable access to insertions. So it really can have a huge impact. And then um, how quickly are you able to place a catheter when somebody between referral to you and getting into the, um, getting the catheter in? So, so we believe in like just in time service. So if you uh, send someone to me, I should be able to put in within 48 to 72 hours. Wow. Exactly, Dr. Shen. That is a point with the IR and IN place catheters. I tell you example of my place. When I joined in 2011, um, we almost literally had no PD program left anymore because the nurse had left and the surgeon who was doing the catheter, they left. I just came out of the fellowship and I'm like, no, you cannot close a place for PD. And what I did was mostly talking to the IR because at that time, there was nobody in the general surgery or vascular surgery who would put it, except one person agreed to do on like, not on very routine basis, but if really needed. But IR agreed to do it and they just watched the videos of the IR uh, based catheters. And we grew our program from two to 30 patients in two years. And just because of that, like the patient coming in the hospital or in the clinic, they did not have any education. And that's the most common scenario is that they did not have pre-nephrology care, pre-ESRD care. So in these patients, you put the order, you send your nurse for the home visit the same day and catheters by IR or IN can be done within two to three days. And that's my experience too. For surgery, you need a pre-op visit, evaluation visit, then anesthesia visit, then OR date. And there are only very few surgeons they're doing, and then they are having a hard time finding the OR place. Um, so yes, accessibility is much, much better and conducive for rapid growth of the program. And you do not lose the interest of patient in that modality. And another thing, like in, yes, in this scenario, it's like it looks very high rate for PD catheter removal and revision. And again, without knowing exact causes, it's really hard to say what happened. Um, we just presented our data in ASN this year, and our rate is not that high of needing revision or removal of IR versus IN based catheters. So, yes, we need to keep on looking into these factors. And, um, and as Dr. Ku said, that it should be just more like a quality improvement project question rather than just like deter
from using the IR-based catheters. Um, thanks for that. And um, Dr. Quinn noted that the very high event rate should be a call to action. It's a major barrier to getting people in home in the U.S., in my opinion, and this was eye-opening. And I would also note that um, Rob actually practices in Calgary. He does not practice in the same part of Canada as um, Arsh Jane, correct? Okay, I'm like, my geography is not very good, but I think I, I have that down. Um, Dr. Zhang, CJ, you had your hand up. Yeah, we have to echo the first two speakers' point of view. We have that discussion in our manuscript too, is uh, the biggest barrier is not enough operator for timely PD catheter placement. Like uh, in Northern California, Kaiser, we have 21 hospitals. And initially, we only have surgeons. Uh, then when patients need a PD catheter, we have nobody put it in. Then they end up with a CVC, go to in-center. And once they're there, they never get out. So we develop an IR who uh, gradually learning the skills and to put in a PD catheter. Um, so now for our hospital, my hospital, we actually have both IR and uh, surgeons who put PD catheter. Some of the hospital only have one specialty. Um, so point of view is when you don't have surgeons to put one in, IR or intervention nephrologist uh, is your best choice to put it in. It's then much better than keep the patient in center. Um, so I think as the time grows, as people get more experience, eventually we'll catch up. And also people pointed out for general surgeon, we usually have to do under general anesthesia. Uh, for people who cannot tolerate that, uh, we send them to IR. And when the volume is so high, when we have patients who are thin, low BMI, does not have surgery uh, before, abdominal surgery before, we send it to IR, they can get it quickly. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, I know that um, <clears throat> there are some people, uh, there are some surgeons who have some qualms um, about putting PD catheters, uh, putting patients with heart failure under general anesthesia um, or doing procedures on people who may have had uh, been a smoker in the past because um, our uh, surgeons are used to doing hernias and that has a correlation, smoking has a correlation with poor outcomes in hernias but that's not necessarily the case for PD catheters. Um, Rob, Dr. Quinn. Thanks, Jen. I just wanted to point out just a couple of other things. You know, it's interesting in the UK where the experience with percutaneous placements much different than the US. You know, their PD catheter registry there showed no difference based on method of insertion. So there are other kind of large looks at this that haven't really demonstrated a difference by method of insertion. I think the other point to make is that, you know, we're hoping in the registry to identify high performing operators, regardless of method of insertion. So if we can find IR docs or nephrologists that are getting the same kind of uh, complication rates that you see with surgical placement or better, you know, these are people that we can identify that we can learn from, see what they're doing differently, and then try to apply those practices to places that are struggling. I, I think the reality is we're going to need percutaneous placement if we're going to meet the demand for PD catheters. And so, you know, I think we really need to look at this rather than having one type or the other is who's the most appropriate patient for a given type of operator and really trying to expand the services and access to them. Um, and I think you guys have a much bigger struggle, honestly, than a lot of other places in the world. We're kind of spoiled um, you guys have, it's much tougher time, I think, for you guys to get catheters placed. You don't have an arse chain around the corner, so. Thanks. Yeah, no, it's true. Um, Wael Hussein, Dr. Hussein made a really good point. He said, how are surgeons and interventional radiologists reimbursed in the new kidney payment models? Is it still a fee for service? I actually don't know. I think it is. I don't think they're included at all in the new payment model. Does anybody know the answer to that? Yeah, I think it is still free for service. That is not part of the bundle, the PD catheter placement. And um, it it becomes another issue too. Like, so for the rest of the audience, uh, this uh, I'm from San Antonio and we deal with a lot of immigrants and, you know, like all those CKD stage five, they learn and they move to cross the border and come here. And sometimes, um, depending on situations, they may be Medicare eligible. Like I do not have a single private payer, basically. They're all either Medicare or some state funded uh, insurance. Um, 
So it, it is still free for bundle, like in the um, retrograde payment for um, Medicare, sometimes they, they are not paid by the for the catheter placement, which was done even on the same month for one or other issue. So it's not part of the bundle. But I agree with uh, Rob point, like every center, um, like these are complementary. These are not um, competitive ways to place the PD catheters. In my center, we that's why we do, like if I see any patients have any uh, like hernia possible, or you are doing a PD catheter for previous refractory peritonitis episode after the PD rest, because they have more chances of additions. So those patients, or they had one surgery done before, so there are some concern of additions from there. So in those patients, we try to get surgery place catheter. Um, and then over the years, I have built relationship and I have cultivated few surgeons to place those catheters. So these should be complementary rather than competitive. Thanks. Yeah, I think this seems to be what all of us are are hearing what works. Now, um, so we don't have uh, interventional um, radiologists. We, I are here, but they don't place them for us. Does anybody else work at a center where you guys only have surgeons placing the catheters where you do have fast access to, um, for example, revisions? Okay, so we are in good company. Um, Tom, uh, Dr. Goldberg said all programs need backup plans regardless of operator, that's true. Um, and then Tom, what do you guys do at Vanderbilt? Or did well, you, well, well, at Vanderbilt and now in Vermont. So uh, Jenny, uh, I sent you, if you check your email and, and send this paper out to whoever, uh, the, all the participants. And this is a very experienced uh, radiologist who places a lot. And, and this is what I mean by backup plans. So you, you got to have a surgeon that can help with the omentectomies, okay? You either need an interventional nephrologist or a radiologist who can get them in urgently for patients that can't undergo general anesthesia. So it, it goes to what uh, Robin Arsh is saying. If you want a big program, uh, and this is what the Kaiser folks do, you got to have some backup plans. And that's what I mean by backup plans. But do, Jenny, uh, send the, uh, any of the participants who want that paper uh, by Chris Morris. Very valuable. Yeah, I'll definitely attach it to the follow-up email that I'll be sending out afterwards. Um, Arsh, Dr. Jane. Uh, I was just going to say, you know, uh, one of the challenges with uh, uh, registry-based data is we don't know a lot of what the individual people are doing. So with the uh, surgical inserters, we don't really know if they're doing um, advanced laparoscopic techniques, i.e., you know, the crab tree style approach, the omentopexies, the simultaneous hernia uh, repair, et cetera. So, uh, you know, uh, I also wonder about that. Uh, and we know that a bunch of them are doing it open, which is basically the same as, as doing it blind. It, it, it's not, it doesn't uh, give you any extra benefit. Um, so I, I, I would wonder whether there's even opportunity to improve amongst the surgeons in, in this, in the study, in, in this case. And if you have a interventional nephrologist or interventional radiologist putting them in, uh, the thought process, you know, in our center is if I put it in, it's, you know, we're saving them a, a procedure, saving them an operation is what I mean, uh, save them a general anesthetic. And, and the only people who've ever ended up in the ICU post uh, insertion in our center have all been surgical insertions. Um, and so then on, on the flip side of that, if you, if you, you know, can save them that operation, then if they do need another operation within or, or another procedure within 90 days or within uh, 180 days, whatever it is, um, it, to actually you know get the catheter working better or doing that omentopexy, at least the chunk of people you save you save them from having to go through the general anesthetic. So I think that you know there definitely is an, a different framework of of thinking about this and and uh, different advantage there. Yeah, no, you make a very good point, Ursh, regarding that that not every surgeon can be crabtree. Um, so much of experience. And that's what I was wondering when I was looking at that paper, that is it possible to do some geocoding 
that out of those 30,000 or 30 plus thousand uh, catheters, how many came from uh, Crabtree region and Crabtree trained surgeons rather than the other surgeons. So that can be one method. And uh, regarding this, um, I was just making another point I totally forgot. Yeah, I was making some point about the avoiding this anesthesia and um, yeah, like uh, if it's needed later on, what's the big deal later on then? Yeah, I think um, the issue with geography, I think um, in the United States, it's so different because everybody goes uh, to their own operator, depending on their insurance, depending on who they know. <clears throat> I mean, I'll tell you, Crowdtree is from our area um, and the surgeons that we work with, um, we might make the introduction, but they certainly hadn't trained um, with him. Um, I do uh, wonder, um, Arsh, so if you do have a complication, um, do you, are you friends with the surgeons in case it needs to be a surgical um, uh, remedy? Yes, my son plays the drums and his son plays the guitar. So they're in a little band together. So that's always helpful. Um, but yeah, no, I, I have a, a really good relationship with uh, both of the surgeons here. Um, so actually one time I, I had gone in and, uh, I noticed that there was a defect in the, in the, uh, in, uh, the rectus sheath and actually right down into the, into the peritoneum I could see. So then I, uh, ended up calling him and he came straight to the, um, the room with me and he fixed it right there on the table, which was amazing. Um, it, it really helps to have a good relationship with them. Like really, 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 and makes me feel so much more comfortable. Yeah. Cause I know, um, not necessarily the surgeons where I practice, but um, like personal friends who are surgeons. I know sometimes um, they complain about having to, um, if they're not friends with other operators, they complain about having to, you know, take care of things that they, they hadn't um, started. Um, so Shweta, Dr. Bansal said, um, Arsh, can you do deep purse string sutures? Yeah, um, I don't do them routinely. So our typical routine is you put a catheter in, wait six weeks, and then you start. So that's got to be like 80 or 80 plus percent of the catheters that are going in. Um, the rest of the time, uh, when it is a little bit more urgent, uh, if I'm doing like a true urgent start or like immediate start within 48 uh, to 72 hours, they're going to be starting on dialysis then I will put in a, a purse string suture, a deep purse string suture around the catheter. So Arsh, you said that you think that it takes closer to 50 catheter insertions to be competent. So if you have somebody who wants to be, who's an intervention nephrologist who wants to start putting in PD catheters, um, but they don't live near you, um, how would they get started to get that experience? Um, without having to mess up on a bunch of patients first? Yeah, good question. I, I mean, we have trained uh, through the, uh, you know, INR, IPDU, uh, trained quite a number of people. Um, I don't think we've ever actually gone back to survey to see how many uh, catheters uh, some people are putting in, but I do know that there are a chunk of them who do put in quite a number of catheters. So it might be, you know, and these, and these people exist across and, you know, across the states, across Canada, like they're all over the place. So I'm sure we would be able to link someone up with someone who's, who's closer by that they could go grab a little bit more experience. I don't know, you know, practically, logistically, I mean, we had this request many times, you know, someone's like, oh, can I come spend a, a couple of days with you? And I'm like, great. But if you're not at technically adept like you know you're, you don't have that much skill set you you can't pick it up in, in such a short period of time you you'd have to have you really need quite a bit of time to, to gain the skill thanks so um it's 125 and thank you guys so much for your attention thank you hey, jenny